also on this call is uh, Matt Devine. Matt is a senior application engineer here with Design Point. Matt, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Awesome, awesome. And um, outside of the two of us, uh, we also have Alan Pincus. He's uh, director for uh, 3D printing here with Design Point. Alan, are you here? I am. Thank you, Dan. Awesome, awesome. And um, yeah, just to ask everyone, uh, attendees, if you could just go ahead and put your phones on mute, that would be really helpful just to avoid any feedback or, or anything like that just to disrupt the flow of the webinar. But um, yeah, we're really excited to you know share with you some of the stuff that we put together for Engineering Week. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just in the, in the way of getting started, uh, what is Engineers Week? So a couple things, right? Uh, you might be familiar with it, might not be. So you know, really what it is, you know, just the time to celebrate how engineers make a difference in our world. Um, uh, secondly, increase awareness for the need of engineers, um, you know, both, both with you know, the younger generation as well as you know, teachers, educators, and parents, um, just to kind of increase that awareness. And you know, uh, piggybacking on that, bring engineering life to kids, educators, and parents. Um, really want to highlight that last point. Um, bringing to life for you know kids, educators, and parents because engineering is, is really cool, actually when you think about it. Um, you know from a day-to-day -day perspective, right now, right now even as we speak, you know we're surrounded by the work of engineers. So uh, you know the car you drive, your iPhone, uh, even your favorite gaming console or something like that. It's it's really fascinating how much of the work of engineers surrounds us in our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, obviously myself and the rest of the Design Point team, um, certainly very happy to raise some awareness in the area. So. Um, again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, who is Design Point? <laughs> you may be asking yourselves. And uh, so, you know, basically, who we are, we provide complete solutions for product design, engineering, uh, and manufacturing, uh, including SolidWorks, CAD, uh, computer aided design, and 3D systems, 3D printers, and offering tools, training, support, you know, and services for helping our clients you know, really optimize their product development process and business results. Uh, as Design Point, you know, is a SolidWorks value-added reseller support, supporting and training our customers and prospective customers is a good point of emphasis. Um, you know, this aspect of the Design Point obviously is, you know, a critical piece of you know ensuring our customers' success, you know, with their investment in the software. So, um, you know, that's a little bit of background on who we are, and you know, just kind of getting into um, when did engineering begin? Where is engineering heading? Just kind of going through you know the evolution of the field. Um, so what we thought would be insightful is just kind of a quick journey through that evolution. Uh, as you can see in the paragraph below, uh, some of the earliest inventions date back to, you know, as far as 3500 BC, uh, the wheel in Mesopotamia, even as far back as 5000 BC, um, something like the rowing oar in early Chinese culture. Um, it's a really exciting time now, you know, with respect to where the technology is today uh, and where it's going. And, you know, again, a common theme throughout is, you know, we really are excited to put this together. Uh, you know, this presentation for everyone just to kind of continue educating uh, parents, teachers, children, uh, you know, as they kind of think about, um, you know, where they want to invest in their future and just kind of providing some exposure and visibility into the field. So, again, you know, we are really excited about that. Um, really just kind of, again, you know, the evolution of the field. Um, you know, there's a lot to it, right? You know, and it dates back to, you know, many, many years ago. Um, 1765, you know, James Watt developed a steam engine that you know, rotated a shaft producing a practical power plant. Um, you know, the Industrial Revolution really changed the way things were made. As, you know, new machines invented in the 1700s and 1800s um, really made it possible for to mass produce goods in factories. Um, even starting in Britain and spreading through Europe and North America, um, really a period of rapid social and you know economic change. Um, so really, you know, obviously dating further back to that, but, you know, just kind of working through the evolution of the field, um, which is really, really exciting. Uh, as you can see in the bottom in 1908, you know, the Model T, uh, an automobile built by the Ford Motor Company, conceived by Henry Ford, and, you know, really a, a product of early engineering, um, which is really super cool. And, um, you know, just really design methodologies. You know, inventions were designed and communicated to manufacturing using paper. Um, you know, with some of the earlier processes of, of engineering, you know, vellum or mylar drawings or blueprints. So, um, obviously, the use of physical prototypes was extensive, and you know, part of that process was very trial and error. Um, a lot of mistakes were made when you know engineering and, and designing, um, you know, these specific parts, and less so today. But you know, again, I mean, you know, back in during this specific time, um, there were a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of mistakes made. Uh, before that, you know, you see something like that, that final product. 
um, you know, again, with the example on the bottom, the Model T. So, um, you know, just kind of taking you through the evolution of the field, which is, which is really cool. Um, engineering 2.0, uh, you know, the digital age, so to speak. So um, really just kind of highlighting the move from something like a drafting board to the computer. Uh, 1970, uh, Boeing 747 jet, you know, arrived in you know, Heathrow Airport in London after completing its maiden flight from New York, which is, which is such an awesome and rapid development in the field. Um, and then spanning all the way to, to 1990 using computers uh, and moving away from something like a pen and paper or pencil and paper. Circles, lines, and arcs used on computer screens. Speeds increased, um, you know, less of a reliance on electrical erasers and things like that. So, um, you know, that earlier, what we mentioned on the trial and error side, um, you know, really start to see the, uh, the field move and become more productive and, you know, obviously, moving forward, uh, technology and, and, and that sort of thing increases, you know, the quicker and easier it is to accomplish a lot of these tasks, um, which is certainly very cool. And, you know, just piggybacking on that, you know, we, we may mention to this, but, um, you know, just kind of moving forward and moving from, you know, pencil and paper to, to the digital age. And, you know, this is kind of right where we're at today, right, the information age, um, you know, leading up till, till today. Uh, Matt's going to touch on some of this with the, the SOLIDWORKS computer-aided design piece, um, but some of the design met methodologies, you know, simulate, test, or validate designs before manufacturing, um, which, is so, which is really cool. Uh, Matt, again, is going to jump into some of those examples a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, but again, just, you know, really, really cool stuff and using a virtual envi environment to accomplish a lot of these tasks versus um, physical prototypes and things like that. And, you know, where things are going, the automation age just is obviously looking down the road into the future. So, um, you know, some really cool stuff in here as well. Um, you know, obviously in the sphere to keeeping things moving, I um, just wanted to give you guys kind of a brief overview of what CAD is. So, you know, uh, it's computer-aided design. Uh, includes 2D and 3D. Uh, 3D is obviously a lot more relevant uh, now in the industry. Uh, engineers using CAD to design products, things like I mentioned before in your iPhone, in this instance, you know, lunchbox, airplane. Um, you, you probably have, you know, an Xbox One, a PlayStation 4, something like that. You know, um, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of initial designs before it looked like what it is today. So, um, you know, again, and today essentially everything is designed in 3D, um, which is where, you know, the trend has kind of come today. So, um, you know, again, just continuing moving forward, what we're going to cover, I know I mentioned it before, but we're going to cover some 3D solid modeling design of a basketball hoop. Uh, Matt's going to run through that from, you know, an idea to something real. Um, basically, we're going to try to figure out and simulate, you know, how much will a basketball hoop bend with the pressure applied to it from a slam dunk, which is actually really cool. Um, and then Alan's going to sort of jump in and run through bringing to reality with 3D printing. So um, I think that's going to be a really cool piece of the presentation as well. So um, I'm actually going to hand the controls over to Matt. And apologies, I fast forwarded to a future slide. But um, Matt, I'm handing the controls over to you. Okay, thanks, Dan. You got it. Okay, so what I'm going to do here for you today is I'm going to start using SolidWorks to design a basketball hoop. So the one that we saw earlier on Dan's slide. Um, this is really mainly just to design something in SolidWorks and then show how we can actually simulate it and use some further engineering tools to actually accomplish a task to test the product to make sure it's going to perform as we expect it. So the first thing I want to do is start designing in 3D. And this is really great, because we can start to sketch out a shape as if you had a paper and pencil. So all I'm going to do is set the center line for this basketball hoop. And I know that it's going to be made with some kind of wire. So I can simply draw a circle and put in the dimensions that I want to use um, for that circle. And then I can keep adding dimensions to this part, just like you would if you were sketching out some kind of design on a napkin, let's say. So you're going to sketch out the shape then throw on the dimensions that you want to work with. And you can see very quickly here, we have the cross-sectional profile of the wire. Now what I'm going to use are some of the three-dimensional features that go a little bit beyond paper and pencil, such as the revolve function, where I'm going to essentially grab this shape by the center line and spin it around 360 degrees like a top. So I use the revolve function, and you can see how it's going to take that shape that I drew and just spin that around 360 degrees. And that's going to actually complete a solid model on the screen. 
So 3D CAD is really cool for getting a three-dimensional shape on the screen, and it's also very easy to use if you can just think of sketching with a paper and pencil. So you'll notice the first constraint that I put on here was actually the 18 millimeter diameter. So I looked up the NBA regulations for a basketball hoop, and I found out that was one critical feature, is we needed to have an 18 inch diameter. And then we also need to have it a certain distance from the backboard. So if I take a rectangle here, I'm going to design the bracket that actually connects to the backboard. And my constraint again here is that it needs to be six inches from this surface to the edge of the rim. So I'm going to simply build that in with a couple dimensions. And then what I can use is some of my other features here. I'm going to offset halfway through the center of this sketch. So I know that the other one was 3 eighths of an inch. And I don't like doing math as, next, as much as the next engineer. So I'm actually just going to do 3 eighths divided by 2 to make my job a little bit easier so I don't have to get out the calculator. And what that does is just lays out the center line of my shape. So now I can attach the rectangle to it ensure that everything's centered, and we're ready to go. So one more dimension here, make this 10, 10 inches wide, and I'm ready to start making the bracket. So I'm going to use another function here called the extrude, and I'm just going to pick the shape that's inside of this region and give it a little bit of a thickness. And again, I'm going to make this 3 16 of an inch, so just type in 3 over 16. And now we have the bracket feature used to make the back of the rim. So again, you can see how fast it is to make shapes inside of SOLIDWORKS. Now this bracket needs to be bent down like an L shape. So I can just start drawing right on this bottom surface, again, as if it were a napkin. And I can connect up, start to generate my shape, make this width 3 16 of an inch again, and then snap it right to the edge. From there, just use the extrude function. Again, just kind of like Play-Doh, and I'm just going to pull that shape straight out of there six inches. And you can see this basketball hoop design is actually coming, coming along pretty nicely at this point. What I want to do is show my original sketch that I used to draw this rim. And then I'm simply going to draw a connecting point right here. So my connection point is going to be where the support bracket actually bolts up to the frame, or gets welded to the frame. So I'm just going to add a few dimensions on here so we know that this looks nice and it's going to work well for us. And then what I'll do after the fact is, just like I'm sketching before, I'm just going to play connect the dots here. And I'm going to connect this point and this point in three dimensions with a spline. So I'm going to start a new sketch here, use my spline function. And just like I mentioned, play connect the dots. And now we have a shape that angles through space to connect those two points. And this is really great, because I can actually take this spline, and I can move this all around in 3D however I'd like to play with the shape and see exactly what I want to get. So I actually want to angle these and snap these along a z-axis. So imagine if I'm looking straight into the screen now. If I have a line that's stuck straight out of the page, straight towards me, that would be my z-axis. So that's where I'm going to align these, these features to. Align that one to the z-axis, and I'll align this guy to the z-axis as well. And that's really going to help control the shape of my spline. And then I can simply add a few dimensions on here just to make it the appropriate size. And I'm ready to start my next shape. So I can see once I have that line sketched out, that's going to be basically a path that I want this circle to follow. And we have a whole host of different tools that we can use within SOLIDWORKS. I'm going to use the sweep feature here and just select a profile and a path. And you can see how it takes that circle that I drew originally. And it's going to make it run right along that new spline that I drew. So again, very quick, very easy to, to work with um, CAD in 3D. So I don't want to have to redraw all those steps on the other side, so I can use a mirror function. Think of this like I'm taking a piece of paper and putting it straight down through, and I'm going to copy everything I did on this side to the other side of that piece of paper. So I'll use the mirror tool here and just select the right plane, which is that center bisecting plane that goes down through the model. From here, we mirror this leg or that arm that I just built. And we have one on the other side, just as easy as that. 
Now to make this look a little bit more clean, I'm going to add some fillets to the corners here. These just basically round over, make the surface a little bit more smooth, as if it were welded together like it would be in, in a real basketball net, basketball hoop. So you can see that's all it really took. It only took me four or five minutes here to generate this entire basketball hoop using SolidWorks. So 3D CAD, again, is very easy, very functional um, to get the job done, what you want to design. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. We'll call this basketball hoop. And it really doesn't look like a basketball hoop quite yet. I think the last finishing touch that I need to put on here is a little bit of color. So we have a whole range of colors that I can apply. I'll get the nice basketball orange color. And now that's starting to look pretty good. So now that I have this design fully completed, I'm very satisfied with it. I want to go ahead and test it for strength. Again, if I'm going to build a basketball hoop in the backyard, I want to make sure that if I dunk, which I can assure you I can do, that this thing isn't going to break on me after if I decide to hang on the rim a little bit. So what I'm going to use is basically I want to separate the face of this model right here so that I have a grip, like as if I were holding on to it with my hands. So that's going to be pretty simple. I'm just going to sketch a few lines, make sure that they're at the pro appropriate angle. And then I'm going to simply offset this to approximate the width of a hand. So I'm going to say that the width of a hand, we'll say it's about six inches wide. That's probably a little bit overkill. Um, but I'm just going to approximate that here with those two lines. Now, another mirror should actually get those to the other side, because most people that play basketball probably have two hands or would hold on with two hands. So I'm just going to split the surface here. And now you can see that I have a grip location here and a grip location here. So I just did a little bit of extra work on this model to prep that for my stress analysis. So the next thing that I want to do is just make sure this is strong enough. And I'm going to do that with the stress analysis tool that's built right into my 3D CAD software. I can start a new simulation study. And I'm going to call this hang test, just so that we know that this is going to be the load of somebody actually hanging on the edge of this basketball rim. So the first thing I want to do is apply a material. So we have to determine what material we actually want to make this out of. Um, so as I'm looking through the list, I'm probably going to go with steel. I think aluminum is probably going to be a little bit soft. Plastic is more than likely out of the question, especially for a real basketball hoop. So I'm going to try to look for some kind of steel material here. And I'm going to go, let's say, plain carbon steel. That's kind of what I have laying around in my garage. So I'll apply that material and close it. Now I'm going to approximate a fixture. So on the back end, we know that this basketball hoop is actually attached to the backboard. So I'm just going to select the face that's attached to the backboard. And you can see setting up this problem is actually very simple. You just think about how it actually works in real life. And that's how you set up your constraints and your forces. So here's going to be my downward force, as if somebody's hanging off of this. I'll just select the two surfaces that we have here. I want to make sure that that's going up and down. I'm going to say 200 pounds for an average sized person playing basketball, maybe hanging on the rim. And that's about all we need to do. You can see right graphically on the screen, the arrows are pointing in the downward direction. So when I accept this, everything should be set up here for me properly. And all I have to do is run the study. So I'm going to click Run This Study. And it's going to go ahead through the process of meshing, which actually breaks the component down into a bunch of very small triangles in the background. And it's going to run through a bunch of equations at each of those triangles. So it can do this a little bit faster than I can. It's solving over 100,000 equations to get the results that we're looking for. And what we wind up getting this broken down into is some stress results. So if you're really interested to see where it's going to break, the red areas show you where this part is actually going to fail. But we, what I'm interested in is the displacement. I want to know that if I jump on this and I hang, how far is that actually going to deform? So we can see real time on the screen that if I jumped and hung on this basketball hoop weighing 200 pounds, it's going to bend about two inches. So two inches might not seem that far, but if you look at your cell phone and you look at the smaller width of it, that's approximately two inches, again, depending on what kind of cell phone that you have. So what I'm going to do here is stop the animation. And we can see that this is an OK design. But with SolidWorks or with CAD, I can actually go back and rerun the study. 
So if we go in here and change the dimension, let's say I want to beef this up a little bit, it's easy just to change a single dimension, and your whole model is going to update for you, which I can then just go and rerun again a second time. So using a 3D CAD program and a simulation tool, we can really get to the core of engineering, where we're not only designing products, we're also testing them and verifying the designs, making changes along the way to make sure that the changes that we propose are actually going to be acceptable. I can see with this, this design, I dropped the deflection from two inches to around three quarters of an inch. So this design would definitely be much more flexible. So what I'm going to do now is turn this over to my colleague, Alan. So he's the director of 3D printing for Design Point, And he's going to go through and see if you're able to make this part using the 3D printer. So Alan? Yeah, I'm here. Just make sure that I show the right screen. That was awesome, Matt. All right, can everyone see my uh, design point screen there? I can see it. OK, great. I can. Um, what I love about engineering, I'm, I'm an engineer myself as well. And I love the fact that I'm always trying to learn new things. And in fact, Dan taught me something new today that I did not know yesterday. That I didn't know I could have people raise their virtual hand and tell me they can hear me. So that's very cool. And the reason I'm curious about that is how many of you out there if you raise your virtual hand, are familiar with the notion or of 3D printing technology, 3D printers? How many of you out there uh, are familiar with that? Let's see if I show a virtual hand. Any hands out there showing, showing it? Yeah, there's some hands. Great. Okay, so a few of you have, and some of you haven't. That's that's excellent. The uh, what I'm what I'd like to do is share with you the the following topics. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is what is 3D printing. Uh, followed by some examples of different types of 3D printers. Um, how we start a, a 3D print using uh, the software that comes with these kinds of machines. And then I've got some high-speed videos of 3D printers in action to give you an idea of how we take what Matt did in the virtual design world and actually turn it into real prototyping. So what is 3D printing? Uh, in principle, 3D printing is nothing more than organized layering of very thin material surfaces that have been bonded or glued together. And in reality, everything is three-dimensional. So for example, here's a piece of paper looking down on a piece of paper. Most people would say, oh, that's two dimensions. It's two-dimensional because it doesn't have any, any real thickness. But as all of us know from dealing with copy paper, that isn't true at all. If I take a ream of paper, 500 sheets of quote-unquote two-dimensional flat paper, and I lay one layer on top of another layer, eventually I'm going to have a pile of paper that is no longer just two dimensions. Well, that's exactly what we do with, in 3D printing. We take our object and we slice it down into very, very thin layers, but every layer is actually has some thickness. So. If I were to zoom in, for example, really with a microscope and look at, let's say, a, in this case, a paper tube I create that's like a paper fiber. And if I stack a, a bunch of horizontal rows nice and neat, and then on the row above it, I made a bit smaller row, and then a smaller row of these little tubes, microscopic tubes, I could eventually create a pyramid shape. Well, if you control that process well enough, and that's what these 3D printers do, we can create any shape, any object, any thickness with incredible precision and accuracy. So the first type of printer that most of uh, you out there probably are familiar with in, in the education area in schools is what is known technically as the quote unquote fused deposition material, which is really a fancy way of saying uh, basically it's like a, glue, a hot glue gun. And if you look at this video, it's very short. I'm sure all of you have used one of these devices where there's solid, a stick of glue in the back, which is actually nothing more than plastic. I'll play it again. And you squeeze the trigger, and the hot glue tip, the hot glue gun tip, melts the plastic, and you can basically draw it anywhere you want. Well, the, through the fused deposition material printer or a filament printer, as it's often called, takes a plastic filament, melts it down, and draws it into that desired shape. So on the right-hand side here, when I start this video, 
this tip right here is the same thing as the tip of a hot glue gun, but it draws the plastic very precisely. And you can see as this video runs that it's actually made all these shapes, these curves, these uh, recesses, and depending on the printer, you can make one of these. You might be able to make 50 of these all at the same time. So that's known as a FDM machine. Some people may have heard of the Cube. Some people may have heard of the MakerBot. Those are the most common versions of this quote-unquote FDM type of printer. However, it gets far more complicated than that. Another machine is known as does what's called powder layer. And the way this works is that a thin layer of powder material is spread across the print bed. An adhesive layer is then drawn onto the powder, but only where it's needed to bond the layers together, glue the layers together. And in the case of the, this particular printer where you see the image, it actually uses color as well. And then the second layer comes out and spread across the first, and where the glue was, that's where the layers stick together. And again, these layers, even though they seem flat, each layer is about four thousandths of an inch thick, maybe about twice the thickness of a human hair. So layer upon layer builds on top of, of, of each layer, and eventually you wind up with a 3D object. So again, it's repeated over and over. So I've got this short little video showing how this machine works, and you'll see the uh, this is in high speed, but it'll come across over and over and over again, putting a layer on top of a layer on top of a layer. Then the powder is recovered that isn't glued together and reveals the object inside. So in this case, it was making a bicycle seat. All of the uncured, unglued powder is blown off and then is put in this adhesive to finish it. And this is a very short, fast video, but basically from beginning to end, we took a design that was originally on a computer in CAD and turned it into a bicycle seat. Not necessarily a real operating bicycle seat in this case, but a prototype of what will become, perhaps, a real bicycle seat in the end. So this is known as prototyping, and this is these machines make it faster and easier to make models of what you're ultimately going to do to help move things along in the manufacturing process faster. The third and final example I wanted to show is yet another form of 3D printing layering process known as UV curable plastics. This machine takes a thin layer of plastic droplets and they are spread across the build surface. There's also a second material in this process called support material and it's placed down wherever there isn't supposed to be the plastic material, it places the support material to hold everything together while the parts being built. And then a UV light flashes to cure the liquid into a solid. And then that support we talked about eventually melts away and you're just left with the finished part. Uh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, went too far. Here we go. So this video kind of shows in operation the print head going back and forth as it builds the parts layer by layer. Each time it goes across it adds another layer of plastic and support material until the part is completely done. And at the very end the parts come out of the printer and we remove the, we melt away the support and you're left with your part. So those were three different technologies in 3D printing. The first one being probably the most common and perhaps this third one being the least common you may be familiar with. Um, so the, the question we get a lot is, well, how do you actually use the printer? Un, uh, much like regular paper printers, there's a software driver uh, that's provided with the, the 3D printer. So the owner of the printer can load the files for printing. So uh, in the case of the basketball hoop, what would happen is Matt did the design on the basketball hoop and we would bring that design into the software. So here, I'm starting the software here, and I may skip ahead a little bit, uh, but we would load what's called, the, in this case, a cube software. And what you're seeing in the middle there is a representation of the build tray of the printer. And what we're doing is we go into our file system, just like you would anything else, like a file you'd want to print on a regular printer, you, you bring it up, in this case, the basketball hoop, we're loading that file, and you can ignore some of these messages that were popping up. But basically, here is the model of the basketball hoop that Matt made, and it's been loaded into the middle of the printer area. So it's literally showing you where the, the basketball hoop will be when it's ultimately printed. I'm going to skip ahead a little 
bit here. And this is a top view of the of the basketball hoop. And basically, this interface allows you to set up you know, where the basketball hoop is. It lets you scale it, change it a little bit. If you want to print three or four of them, you can load the print bed with three or four or five of them. Uh, but basically, every printer comes with some sort of interface like this so that ultimately you can, quote unquote, print the part out just like you might print a piece of paper with your Word document on it. We're literally printing out the basketball hoop that Matt designed earlier. So here is a, an FDM printer, the cube actually, printing part of the basketball hoop. So for those who've never seen this, what it's doing is it's taking all the information of the design that Matt created, it's creating, taking it and making thin layers of it, and layer by layer by layer, it is drawing out the plastic onto the surface of the printer. And in this case, I think this would take two or three hours to print. So it's not the fastest technology when you compare it to printing a piece of paper. Uh, you'll have a piece of paper fully printed Word document in a few seconds. Uh, 20 years ago, it might have taken 30 seconds or a minute to get uh, a piece of paper printed out. We take for granted that now it comes out in seconds. I think in the future someday maybe this will be printing out in seconds as well. Here's the second video showing the hoop ring itself being printed just from a, another angle so you could see see it being printed. And this is, this is real time. This is actually how long it takes uh, the printer to move. The other types of printers, some print faster, some print slower, some print with stronger materials, some print um, uh, with much higher resolution so you get finer detail. So each printer technology has its advantages, uh, its pros and cons, basically. So there is a partially finished uh, hoop that we created from directly from Matt's design. And you can see that's a picture of uh, a partially finished uh, hoop, uh, basketball hoop. We tried to print two of them. The second one, we interrupted it so that we could have it ready for this, uh, for this um, presentation. Um, the last thing I want to show you was a high speed, a couple high speed videos of a printer in action. So this printer is moving in about a hundred times normal speed from a video capture standpoint. And it's printing a three dimensional model of somebody holding up their hand, making the OK symbol. You can see that this actually took about eight hours to build, and there's thousands of layers that it's creating. But in the end, you should be able to tell now that you've got somebody making the OK symbol with the thumb and four finger facing you. This other video, this is, again, high speed video of what took in real time about four to six hours to print. It's actually making a small watering can Again, both of these are the uh, what's called the cube printer, uh, made by 3D Systems. And within seconds of the video, you can see that layer upon layer, it's creating uh, the finished object. And these materials are called um, ABS. That's the acronym for the type of plastic that it's, it's uh, using to create these objects. I think that one's just about done. There's the finished object. Oh, and my perfect timing, my PowerPoint has crashed. But that was my last slide. So uh, thanks for everybody's attention. I hope that was uh, informative for you. I'm going to switch uh, back over and change this, uh, give us back over to uh, Dan. So Dan, thanks. it's all yours. And yeah, I know that um, we're all probably extremely familiar with glue guns and perhaps even more familiar with getting hot glue mistakenly all, all over our hands when using those glue guns. Oh. <laughs> so thanks, Alan. That was awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, this was really awesome, guys. Look, I mean, you know, we, we, we wanted to put something really cool together for you guys, and uh, I, I knew a little bit about what Alan and, and Matt were going to show, but, you know, not in which the detail that they went. So yeah, that was really awesome, and, uh, you know, we hope you guys found a lot of value in that, too. Um, and obviously, thanks for joining. I, I think it was really cool what Matt showed, too. You know, if you guys remember back to the evolution of engineering portion, um, you know, initially it was a lot of trial and error, you know, in terms of perfect, or perfecting a product uh, and ensuring it functions in a real-world environment. And, you know, it's, it's really cool to understand where the technology is at today. You know, Matt showed us how we can do that now 
uh, in a virtual environment, again, to test how these products will perform. So I, I really thought that was cool, and I, I hope you guys do too. So um, again, you know, what you kind of saw started with an idea. It could be anything, uh, as we alluded to earlier. Um, 3D model was created, you know, virtually. We created the basketball hoop. I, I know that if I were to dunk in a basketball hoop, I probably couldn't bend, get it to bend that much. But uh, again, a real-world simulation, when will it bend, uh, brought the hoop into reality with the 3D with the 3D printing portion as well. So you can kind of see the interchange between those, um, you know, between those two technologies and how they complement each other. So, um, hey, look, tell us what you thought on Twitter. Um, you know, hashtag EV2015. If you guys have any questions on what you saw today, please reach out to us. Um, you know, by by phone or email. Uh, I know we didn't post our information here, but um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll make an attempt to you know maybe follow up with you guys and. Uh, you know, let us know if you have any questions whatsoever. Again, I know we kind of uh, went a little bit over than we planned, and it's about 10 after 6. So thanks for bearing with us. Uh, hope you enjoyed it and found some value in it. And, uh, you know, we look forward to uh, participating similarly, if not, you know, in a larger capacity um, for the next Engineers Week. So, again, thanks so much, everyone. And, you know, obviously a huge thanks to everyone on our end, Alan, Matt, and myself. <laughs> and uh, have a great evening, everyone. Thanks so much. Take care.